<clears throat> well, here we are again. So I am just gonna wait for our first ones to jump on. Oh, there's my first one. I don't know who it is. Can't tell. Susan. Hi, Susan. How are ya? Alter Gracious on. Uh, Jan is on. Hope you got your popcorn or your M&Ms. Susan's here. Jan's here. Donna's here, my cuz. Beth is here. Wow, Shirley Gable is here. So, um, y'all are my, are my, um, favorite people in the world. Y'all are, because you participate, because you watch this, these videos every week. Um, Angela's on. So, nice to see you all tonight. I know I'm not saying that correctly, but Marsha's on. She says, hi, Cheryl. It's Marsha Wilson-Smith. Hi, Marsha. We go back, way back, when I was little, young, I should say. Brenda's on. You are ours all. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, I appreciate that. Shirley Giles is on. Okay, so I can see up here in the up here in the top, I can see Brenda's face and whoever has like their face on their profile, I can see it. But if they don't have their face on their profile, then sometimes I don't know who it is um, unless you say something. Hi, Brenda. By the way, I'm coming to Michigan uh, next week for a couple weeks, I think. I'll be in, I'll, I'll let you know. So, okay, anyways, so um, tonight is, or this week is week four. This is what we're discussing on Facebook, and um, it's called Sweet Smelling Sacrifices. So if you've done your lesson this week, oh my goodness, you're in for a, I mean, I know that you know that people that haven't are in for a great treat because I think it was such an awesome, awesome week of study. Do you agree with that? Hi, Ellen. My Ellen is on here. Shirley, I have like three or four Shirley's that are in the Bible study and that participate. And um, so I love that because one of my very, very best friends, her name is Shirley too. So, but she's not doing the Bible study this time. She has led some of my studies before though. But anyways, um, let me open with a word of prayer and um, then we'll just begin with what God has put on my heart about sweet smelling sacrifices. Okay. Oh dear Lord in heaven, we just come before you right now. Father, obviously I can't see the faces, I can't um, hear their, their voices, I can't, I can't experience, I can't hug them when they walk in to the room and that's that late, sorry about that, that was um, the doctor's office calling. Anyways, um, so I can't, I can't like um, touch them and and look into their eyes as we talk and and um, but I can hear their hearts as they participate in the discussion and um, several of them actually many of them have sent me messages saying what a blessing this Bible study is to them Lord we just want to thank you for the Apostle Paul and for um, his love for the Philippian believers Lord, I love this relationship between them. I wish I saw this more in the church today. Um, I believe that it has gotten better, but I just think that we have such a long way to go. But the Apostle Paul is teaching us. He's teaching us how to live, how to conduct ourselves, how to be a church. He's teaching us that. And so um, this week we talked about sweet smelling sacrifices. And Lord, we know that, that when we do things that please you, when we sacrifice our lives 
it's a sweet smelling sacrifice and this is something that you totally love to see in your people Lord so Lord um, I just ask that you will um, go before me today and speak this message speak it Lord loud and clear and um, Holy Spirit we ask that you will converge upon every home upon every place wherever they're at if they're in the car if they're in their office if they're at their kitchen table watching on the computer or watching on their phone Lord I just ask Holy Spirit that you would just converge upon each place as the Word of God goes out and I pray Lord that you will give us all something to hold on to something that we can grasp so we just thank you and we give this time into your hands Lord and I'm excited I'm excited for what you um, have laid on my heart today so thank you Lord in Jesus name amen okay so we are all set here um, so I, I think that one of the things that we're learning through Philippians is that um, the thing that we really need to strive for in our lives is to please God. Do you agree with that? I mean, that should be our number one goal. I'm sorry, excuse me, but this keeps, okay, sorry. Um, there was a voicemail and it was popped up there in the, in the front or in the top and I couldn't see. Um, all of your names and stuff so I just think that we really need to focus on pleasing God and what that means because the more we please God the more um, it's like that sweet smelling sacrifice and it puts a smile on his face and so to set the stage tonight um, I wanted to talk to you and um, I wouldn't call it really a theology lesson although one day one day, probably more than one day, I'm sure, um, we're going to get some good theology lessons. Not in uh, Philippians, but I'm just itching to um, give some good theology because I just believe that um, a lot of times the church doesn't really give good theology. And I'm talking about the theology of the church, of God, of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit, and, and just what the Bible says I mean, I remember the very first time that I took a class before um, um, before I actually went to Bible college um, for my church. There was a, um, a an adult class that was led, and it wasn't college credit, but um, my pastor and another couple um, teachers from the church actually. Um, taught at it and I remember going to that class and and because um, I was just so hungry and I remember taking my very first theology class so I learned all this stuff and I just remember I was like a sponge I'm just like oh my goodness there's so much good stuff so hold on one one day we're gonna get a good theology uh, teaching but I believe that to set the stage, we have to understand what Jesus did for us and um, what has been done for us in order for us to truly please God because we're not going to want to please him unless we truly understand and, and I really do believe that as Christians, a lot of times we really don't understand and um, maybe there's things about our Christianity that we're just kind of in the dark on and I wish I could answer everybody's questions and um, obviously I don't know them all but um, imagine being the, the Apostle Paul and writing his letters and learning this stuff for the very first time I mean I was just like in awe reading some of the passages that I'm gonna read to you tonight I was just in awe and and thinking to myself oh my goodness this is so brand new to him and how he what he must have thought okay well anyways that was just beside the point and I better get moving or we're not going to have enough time so there's four words that I want to give you tonight to help you understand a little bit more about what Jesus has done for you so the first word is this 
acquittal. Acquittal. Now, you and I know that when someone is is um, is is in court, um, that if they're acquitted, that means that all of their um, crimes or whatever, or if there was no crimes, that they were a sponge from their record. So acquittal means to declare not guilty, to settle a debt. Okay, so in so in order for me to um, totally capture this word acquittal. I think we we need to start in the cla in the in the courtroom. So this is just a fictitious courtroom, but I think it will really portray the point very clearly for all of us. So in this courtroom, there are four people, just four people, and so the first person, of course, is the judge, and the judge is sitting behind the big desk, or the big uh, yeah the big desk, the big mahogany desk or whatever. And he um, is a strong, strong man. And so in, in our courtroom, the judge is God. And then sitting in front of the, the judge would be two on two different sides. On, on one side, you have the prosecuting attorney. And um, he has come with his case built up. And he is all ready to prove the person, the defendant, is um, guilty and so the prosecutor is Satan okay and so on the other side of the courtroom there's two people sitting at the table the defendant which is me or you the defendant so and then and then you have brought your defense attorney with you and that is Jesus so in the courtroom, there's God, there's Satan, and on this side, there is you and Jesus sitting there. Okay, so God takes control of the session. And so he looks out at these people sitting there, and so he gives the floor to the prosecutor, to Satan. And so he says, Satan, you have, you have so much time and I, I want you to state your case, okay? So Satan has come very well prepared. He stands before the court. He stands there with his head held high, his chest out, and he just seems like he knows what he's doing, okay? He, so he says, Your Honor, I bring Cheryl before you today. I bring her before you today. She has done so many things wrong, especially because she's a Christian. Sin is her greatest offense. She has lied. She has stolen. She has used ugly words at times. She has gossiped. She has failed to pray for that one friend that asked her to pray. She has a shopping problem. Oh, and did I mention she worries and frets about everything? And then the list goes on and on. And he just keeps stating all the things that he's bringing against me. So the list goes on and on. And when he's done, there is a hush in the courtroom. No one, no one is saying a word. You can hear a pin drop. It's so quiet. No one stirs. Not even the angels are stirring. So Satan sits down, the judge, God. He looks, he looks at Satan, then he looks at me. And as he looks at me, I kind of think that he, there's a gleam in his eyes. So does he know something that I don't know already? Did I catch that gleam in his eyes? So he says, with his commanding voice. He says, okay, Jesus, it's your turn now. What do you have to say on behalf of your defendant? What do you have to say about these accusations? So, say, so Jesus, sorry. So Jesus stands up and it just seems like he knows his way around the courtroom. It seems like he's been there many times before. He commands attention just by his presence. Everyone calms down. Everyone stops what they're doing. He puts a firm grip on my shoulders. Somehow I know that he is going to present a riveting case. 
And I just think to myself, oh, how glad I am that I have entrusted my life and my future into his hands. He walks towards the judge and he looks at the judge and then he turns around and he looks at me and he says, in his strong voice, he says, my client is not perfect. She has struggled to walk in obedience. I'll give you that. She has struggled to walk in obedience to your word. In fact, she has done some of those things that Satan has said, but many of those things, he has nothing, no, no proof of it. Yes, she has sinned, absolutely. But, but, and he looks at the judge and he stands in the middle of the courtroom with just his presence and he says, but, I offered my life for hers. I died for her freedom. My blood was shed so her sins could be a sponge from her record. I paid her price in full. I paid it in full with my blood. Therefore, your honor, he says, I ask for leniency. I ask that you will not hold these offenses against her. She has asked for forgiveness. She knows she's been wrong. She's asked for forgiveness. Then he goes and he sits down. And then there's a quietness, a stillness again. What is God, what is the judge going to say to this? And then all of a sudden, the judge sits up straight and he takes his gavel on his desk and he pounds it on the desk. And he says, I find you, Cheryl, not guilty. You are free to go. You are free to go. That is what acquittal is all about. And that is you and I. That is you and I. I almost didn't make it either, Jan, through that. So the first, the first one is, a, is acquittal. Jesus paid for our price. He paid the price for us. The next one, the next word is this, reconciliation. And we find a good description of this in Colossians, if I can find it. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verses 19 through 22. It says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, now, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. At one time, my friends, you and I were estranged from God. We were an enemy of God because that's how we were born. But you see, Jesus came to change all of that. Jesus came to change all of that. And when he died on the cross and shed his blood, he reconciled you to God. So he was the stepping stone to God. Before you could never have a relationship with God. You could never talk to him where he would talk back. We were estranged. We were enemies of God. And through Jesus' death on the cross, he brought you into reconciliation with your God, the God of the universe. Imagine that. And that same God, the God who created the universe, wants a relationship with you and with me. With you and with me. So acquittal, reconciliation, and the third word is 
victory. And along with victory comes the word overcomer. We can overcome anything the Bible says. Victory is a, now listen to this, victory is a success or triumph over an enemy in battle. And you and I know who our enemy is and we know what the battle is. And one day, one day, we are going to have complete, complete victory over him, over him. Listen to what it says in Luke, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. It says this, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Oops, I am not in the right, oh, wait. 10, 19. Don't rejoice because, or rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Oh, I, I wrote down the wrong verse. It's the verse ahead of that. So, verse 19. I'm just going to start at verse 18. Yes, he told them. This is Jesus talking. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Now, literally, I would not want to walk among snakes and scorpions, the, the creepy crawlers that crawl along our ground. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those enemies that come against us that are ready to attack us at any minute. We can have, we can overcome. And along with that thought... Along with that thought comes Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. You know this passage probably very well, but I want to read a few verses to you because this is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Verse 31, I'm starting there. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? And you'd have to read the passage ahead of that to figure out what he's talking about. If God is for us, who can ever ever be against us since he did not spare even his own son but gave him up for us all won't he also give us everything else who dares accuse us whom god has chosen for his own no one for god himself has given us right standing with himself who then will condemn us no one for christ jesus did for us and or uh, for christ jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and he is sitting in the place of honor at god's right hand pleading for us can anything ever separate us from christ's love nothing does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death as the scriptures say for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Jesus Christ, who loved us. Who loved us. Oh my goodness gracious. The Bible tells us that you and I are, are have victory over Satan. Now I know that sometimes he wins those battles. But I'm, I'm talking about the end, the end when we stand before God. Imagine the day when we will be marching in a victory parade with believers from the four ends of the earth, the four corners of the earth with the king of kings at the head. Imagine that day. Won't that be awesome? That will be awesome. So we have victory, victory over sin and death, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. So Jesus Christ acquitted us. He's reconciled us and he's given us victory. And the fourth word is this, righteous, which means right standing with God, right standing with God. You know, we often think of ourselves as these imperfect beings and we often focus on our imperfections but i want to tell you that through the cross of jesus christ when you came to know jesus christ that changed everything for god he does not look at your imperfections he sees you as holy and righteous because now you can stand before god and you are made right in his eyes 
in his eyes. It says in Romans 5, 8 through 9, it says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And Christ, and, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, we will certainly save us, or he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. So we are made right. So I, I just felt like I needed to set the stage. That was a long setting of the stage, I know. So a good portion of my message was, was about these things. And, and these are just a fraction of what Jesus has done for you and I. What Jesus has done for you and I. He sees us as holy and righteous. He sees us as holy and righteous. So these things alone should make us want to please God. He saved us so nothing should matter more than giving our lives for him. Do you agree with that? That's exactly what Paul did. I mean, my goodness, he was learning these things for the very first time. He's the one that wrote down the, the a good portion of the doctrine for the church, almost all of it. Not all of it, but a good portion of it. He wrote down through the, through the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot more people that are joining, and I'm so happy. So Jesus acquitted us. He reconciled us to, to God. He has given us victory. Imagine that victory party that we're going to all go to one day. And he's made us right, in right standing with God. And so something was happening to Peter when he wrote down this in um, his letter to, um, the, to the believers in, in Asia Minor when he was... Something was going on in his spirit, and I don't know, maybe he was thinking about these things. Maybe um, God, you know, he was just learning and, and teaching the people. But listen to what he said, and I love Peter. I wrote a Bible study on him because I can so relate to him. He seems like when, when he was walking with Jesus, you know, he stuck his foot in his mouth more than once, and he got in trouble quite a few times. But once his ministry started, after Jesus was gone, Peter became a different person. He was on fire because now he had the Holy Spirit living and residing in him. And oh my goodness, there was no stopping him. And sometimes we think that Paul was the greatest evangelist of the first century. And, 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 and he was certainly absolutely one of, the, one of the most popular ones. But Peter was too. And, um, and the reason why we don't have a ton about Peter is because we have... Peter's ministry in the beginning of Acts, we have his ministry, but then after Paul came to know Christ in Acts chapter 9, um, it starts on Paul's ministry. So it begins with Paul's ministry, so then we follow Paul in his ministry, but during that whole time, Peter was still in ministry, and why do we follow Paul? Well, most likely it's because um, Luke wrote the book of Acts, and Luke was in, in Paul's inner circle, and he traveled with Paul. So that's what was on his mind as the early church was getting underway. And, um, but Peter was also a great um, forefather or a great uh, founder of the early church and one of the um, biggest leaders. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, I ne I'll never forget the very first time that I read this passage, and I'd probably read it before, but it was when I was in college, and so I probably heard it read before, but this time it just like, have you ever read something and it just like burns your whole spirit, and it's like, <gasps> it just like, it just like jumps off the page? <clears throat> well, that's what this did in First Peter, but listen to these words that Peter was saying. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is by his great mercy that he has been, that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. 
Now, what do I love about this? I love his adjectives and I love his passion. And so many of you have said, you know, that they appreciate my passion. Once I get going, I'm just like, there's no stopping me because I just get so excited about what I'm reading and about what I'm teaching and about what Jesus, what, what God, the Holy Spirit is teaching me through his word. But he uses great adjectives. So he said, it is by his great mercy, not just mercy, but great mercy. Now we live with great expectation, not just expectation, but great expectation. We have a priceless inheritance beyond the reach of change and decay. Can you imagine what was going through Peter's mind and, and his spirit when he was writing this down? I mean, I've had these kind of encounters with God that it's like, oh my goodness, and I just can't get enough. And, you know, obviously we have the computer and so we can type it really fast, but he had a little quill in his hand and, and he had to keep dipping it in the ink, you know, to write it. And Okay, Lord, I'm getting it, I'm getting it, but, you know, slow down a little bit, I don't know. Anyways, I'm just saying that he was so excited. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to be excited like that because as Paul poured, because of his excitement and, and, his, and what he knew about what happened to him, he poured out his life as a sacrifice on the service of all the other people, of the believers all over the place. So Peter said it best. So because of this, he says, be truly glad. So I want to encourage you to seek to please him because that is what makes that sweet smelling sacrifice when we, when we seek to please him. And how do we do that? Well, there's two passages that I want to bring before you. Well, first of all, let me, let me remind you that in the Old Testament, when they had the sacrifice of the animal, and they brought the animal, and they laid the animal on the sacrifice, and they, they killed the animal, and they, they burned him up. That was a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God. That was a sweet-smelling sacrifice. And obviously, we don't have the same, we are not under the same sacrificial system as they were in the Old Testament because Jesus became the, 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 the spotless lamb and he took the place of that sacrificial system. And so now we are underneath the new covenant. But... We need to still sacrifice because sacrificing our lives shows God how pleased we are, what he's done for us, what he's done for us. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 12. You know these passages that I'm going to read before you right now, but I'm just going to um, just go through them just real quickly. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, I urge you to give your bodies to God. In other words, sacrifice your bodies, or you could say your life to him, because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable, the kind he will breathe in and go, Oh, that smells so good. Oh, and it puts a smile on his face. And that's what you and I want. We want to put a smile on his face. This is truly the way to worship him. Sometimes we think that the only way to worship him is on Sundays in church when we stand before him with all the congregation and we're singing these songs and we're praising and worshiping him. And yes, yes, yes. That is an awesome way to worship him. But I think that he looks at worship even, even in a totally different light. I think that he takes it further. And the sacrifices that we give for him is a way to worship him. So I believe that it's not just our bodies. Because our bodies are human. They're flesh. I believe that what we need to do is what Paul did. We need to pour out our lives. Our lives for God. Everything that we are should be all about God, should all be all about God. But the last uh, passage that I wanted to bring before you is a familiar one to you too in Hebrews chapter 12. Listen to what it says. And this gives us an idea of how you and I can sacrifice our lives and bring great uh, pleasure to God. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, 
since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Now he's, the writer of Hebrews is writing this after he wrote Hebrews 11, which is the Hall of Faith Museum with all those incredible people and those, those people that lived a life of faith. He now comes to chapter 12. And of course, when he was writing it, there was no chapters. They were divided up later down the road when they were canonizing the whole scriptures. He said, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Let us run with the weight. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So the, the key piece of information right here is, as you know, we're in a race. We're in a race, and we're running to the finish line. Absolutely. But the key piece of information here is, um, let, us especially, or let us throw off every sin that trips us up. Let us throw off. So it is important that we try to remain holy and try to remain pure according to God's word. And so the things that God reveals to us, the things that we know are not wrong, that are not right, the things that are wrong, the sin and different things that we do in our lives, we need to throw those things off because you see, if we don't, we are going to be held back and we are not going to be the sacrificial um, people that God wants us to be. We're not going to be able to sacrifice like we need to sacrifice. So God has been truly speaking to me. And then in your lesson this week from our Bible study, um, we did, an, um, we did an, an assignment on page 92, and it's in week five, and, uh, or it's day five, I'm sorry, um, in week four. And we looked at Psalm 112, and, and I was so, I mean, when I was doing this lesson, I was so blown away. Because we did, we looked at Psalm 112, and on one side we wrote, what brings honor to God? And on the other side, what rewards does he give by, being, by bringing honor to God? And so bringing honor to God is fearing the Lord, finding delight in his commands, staying righteous. I just talked about that. Um, generous and, and lends freely and that your your heart is steadfast and you're trusting in the Lord and you've given you you've given your gifts to the poor those kinds of things what are the rewards for that oh my goodness this is like that sweet smelling when 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 Jesus smells that it's like oh my goodness then he rewards us and so he talks about that our children will be mighty in the land and and that their generation will be, or our generation will be upright, or their generation will be upright. Good will come to, to people, and and uh, and I can't even read my writing. Anyway, so there's a bunch of stuff. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, to do that assignment. Because that will just bring this whole message into clearer focus for us. But here's the thing. We are to pour out our lives as a drink offering, just like the Apostle Paul did. Just like the Apostle Paul. So here's my, my closing remark. Let's seek to please him with our whole life. With our whole life. Let's seek to please him. Let's tell him. Go before God and say, Oh Lord, I want to emulate the Apostle Paul. I want to live like he did. I want you to be pleased with my life. Show me what I need to throw off. And show me how I can, how I can stay pure and holy. So that I can become that sacrifice that you so want me to be. So that was my message for tonight. Um, thank you so much. And I will read all of your comments later because when I get moving, I, um, I just talk. So anyways, so now we come to our gift here. 
Jesus, Jesus said, I am the resurrection of, and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. John 11, 25. So we had a lot of people sign up for this or to put their name in for the drawing. Here's all the names. So my mom cut them up earlier and I am, I have no idea who's going to win this. So here it is. Let's find out who is the winner tonight. And it is Rena Perry. Rena Perry, congratulations, Rena. I will be sending you a message to get your address, and um, I would, I, it is my privilege to get this to you too. So I know that you'll find a great place to put this, and you'll be reminded of um, what Jesus has done for you. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, so this week we we had great discussion on. Um, on day one of week four on our Facebook page this week. So um, thank you for being so faithful. Oh my goodness. I am so blessed and um, I just, I'm just in awe of what's going on and I love this Bible study and I'm hearing from you all that you do too. So if you're behind, cut, you know, just Take your time, but catch up when you can, but make sure that you do catch up, even if it's after we're done. You'll be so glad you did. So thank you for joining me, and have a blessed week, and we'll see you online this week.